Jilly Ron, this one's for you. <laughs> so Moshe and Jilly um, are going to talk about digital brutalism. And I think we'll learn more exactly how, what that is and how that works out by their talks. But I, I just want to say I really, really like the word digital brutalism because it takes something so touchable, which is brute concrete, and puts it into the untouchable or the, the digital. So, yeah, sorry. You want to say something? Yeah, like that's it. true. It's actually one of the important aspects of it, like the materialism and, yeah, we, we'll get into that. <laughs> Hell yeah. So, um, Jilly is a digital designer. Hello, Jilly. And Ron, you are a game developer. So we're going to hear about... Do we hear Jilly? I see her talking, but I don't hear her. Jilly, can you say something? Ah, I see. No, we cannot hear you. <laughs> so while we wait for Jilly to get set up, um, we will be hearing a discussion between someone who's more focused on game design and development and someone who is more focused on the, the design. Can you elaborate on that a bit while we yeah, wait for Jilly? Um, I'm a huge architecture nerd and a game designer. Um, I love to um, yeah, use um, brutalism in my experiences, in my virtual experiences. And Jilly is uh, the expert. Um, she studied arch architecture and yeah, that what makes it so interesting because I, I'm just a hobbyist and I, yeah. I'm very interested in the topic but I never studied it or, or, or yeah, got into the academics of it. Um, so, yeah, there's hopefully a good conversation happening. How do you like Silent Green, then? Oh, it's perfect. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, the essay set from last year was, not last year, oh my god, um, three years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was also amazing. Um, had also all the concrete that I love, um, but this space is also very impressive. I love the like when slope you, you take down into the space. The pink lights. It sets the mood. It's very good. I think it's a great space. Uh, yeah. It's, it looks very, like it has this very Berlin feel of like, oh, you're in a, in a what, like an old cemetery, which turned into a... Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> turned, turned into a, an event space, so from very silent to very loud. True. And bringing the contrast that we'll hopefully see soon with yeah. a professional architect and a hobby architect discussing what this would do in the digital space. Yeah. So, Jilly, can we hear you? I will get a bottle of water in the meantime, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, maybe do that, yeah. <laughs> I was going to get it for you, but... I know where it is. You know where it is, exactly. <laughs> Woo, bottle of water! Woo! Hey, I heard a sound. Yes, Jilly! Going once, going twice. Yeah. Can you hear us well as well? There I am. Yeah, there you are. Can you hear us as well? Hello, can you hear <laughs> Jilly? <laughs> can you hear Moshe? That's maybe the most important part. Do tell. Hello, hello. Yeah, that's the face. That's the face that we wanted to see. Aren't we all glad that most of the online things have moved offline now? But we'll get there. Won't we, Moshe? We will get there. Yeah, I'm sure. We will keep it short then. <laughs> I, I suppose, yeah. Maybe I'm, I'm just going to have a seat if you don't mind. No, yeah, come join me. 
So are you living here uh, around here in Berlin? Um, no, I'm from Hamburg, actually. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So you've traveled here just for a maze? Yeah, just for a maze. Um, yeah, I'd love to, to visit a maze. You want to stay here a bit longer? or you gonna um, No, only for one night, unfortunately. I would have loved to stay longer, and um, I was very jealous about the people who are already here <laughs> and spending the weekend here in Berlin, yeah. drawing all the nice pictures. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you can come whenever. Huh? You can come whenever again. Yeah, sure. It's always it's open for free-spirited people. Yeah, it's not that far away. Uh, and it, it is not. Oh, also, uh, with the nine euro ticket, to, like it's going to be just so easy to yeah, just, we'll like, just hopscot around all over come Germany. Come back and forth from Berlin and Hamburg. <laughs> Do maybe some some architecture tourism. Oh, yeah, I would love to. I would. I, I wish I had the time to explore the city a little bit more. Um, when I when I came here to to Berlin, I, I had some great. I saw some great buildings out of the bus, and I was uh, sad that I couldn't spend some time with them. <laughs> do you, do you <laughs> spend time with the buildings? Yeah. Very caressing uh, concrete wall. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, see where we got it here now. Mm. But do you have any favorite buildings in Hamburg that you can tell us about? Yeah, definitely. Um, so in the most brutalist buildings in Hamburg actually are uh, most of the time churches yeah, out of churches some, yeah out of some reason uh, most brutalist buildings are churches and also a lot of old bunkers um, from yeah, the right, world right. war um, we ha I had also a very interesting talk about that with Jilly about the bunkers and why they are um, above the surface and not yeah. underground like in most cities um, I, I bet she can tell you tell more, more about, about that, that. Yeah. Um, and yeah there's this uh, building called I am so ah Jilly <laughs> Hey, can you hear us? Hello, hello. Ah, yes? Is that a yes? Yes. So we can hear you. This is wonderful because I can hear you too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we got there. One big round of applause. <laughs> Great. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely to have you. I think then I will have to leave now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. See you later. <laughs> and I want you to. Open this up with a big round of applause again for Masha in Chile. Masha, I'm so sorry, I'm late. No worries. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm this glad is wonderful. You're here. So, thank you uh, for being so kind and already starting on uh, one of my favorite topics um, talking about digital environments, uh, tangibility in digital environments. And to those of you joining, um, so in this session, as they mentioned, we will be um, discussing the digital environments designed by Moshe. We also did the beautiful maze space for this festival. And I hope you've had the pleasure of already joining. And if not, you could uh, join from the online link from the website. And uh, maybe, do you maybe have the uh, presentation already up and running? I yeah, I have it there. on my laptop. I don't know if you can see it or bring it up to the big screen. Mm, I, have, I, I have an HDMI screen. plugged into my laptop. I hope that's enough. This is great. So, and also the camera is at the moment on you, so I can tell what's on the screen above oh, you. Oh, yeah. Um, you see a little bit like a portion of it, maybe. Just a teeny tiny bit, but at the moment it's still me. <laughs> um, so what I will start out with saying, um, maybe I'll introduce myself a little bit. Yeah, so, yeah, let's show um, it, lose the time like that. Let, let, let's do that. <laughs> and we'll just have the, the slides of my work uh, running in the background as soon as they are. So I'm an architect, as Moshe uh, mentioned, and uh, my special pleasure is with digital uh, design and fabrication, which means I work with um, 3D modeling, immersive environments, um, 3D printing, robotic arms, uh, all in the making of speculative design and immersive and interactive installations. And what I'm fascinated about is um, speculative design, as I mentioned. So how we could bring about different designs to talk about different possible futures and relate to them through design and maybe um, become critical about them through the design. And um, this is how yeah, Moshe sure. and I uh, um, get to know each other and get to talk about the it. Um, 
maybe another step forward. Um, so part of what I do um, aside of a maze is design human robot interaction and speculate about our futures uh, with robots. And what brings me um, here today um, is, as I mentioned, the beautiful works by Moshe. And you've managed to, uh, you had some time to introduce yourself already, but maybe I'll, I'll add a bit more about it. So Moshe is an indie game a designer and developer, and he's creating experimental experiences with a focus on virtual brutalist architecture and the concepts and the concept of um, what it takes to create atmospheric and immersive environments. Um, and this is a great pleasure to um, be joined by our mutual uh, um, appetite for brutalism. Yeah, thank you, Jilly. Um, I think what is very important for me is, in, uh, in fact, the, the atmosphere and the immersion that I try to portray in my spaces. Um, and for this year's MA space, the virtual um, counterpart of this festival, um, it was very important for me that the players can immerse themselves in the in the environment and um, that they can explore the space a little bit um, more freely and um, that the exploration itself becomes an experience um, besides the actual actual, actual exhibi exhibition and uh, the talks and um, the social uh, aspects of it. Um, it's it's almost like in real life when you're um, the first time at a new space and you, you have to explore the space, um, you you walk to through it and um, it is it is very interesting to me how um, I try to to um, fake this this feeling of um, being for the first time in a very complex um, space. I think this is exactly you're bringing me exactly to the point I'm, I'm very interested uh, in. So you're creating this very hospitable space. Um, but you choose brutalism and a maze-like space to host it. How, how do you find that the aesthetic and the space itself are um, contributing to such experiences? Why do you choose brutalism for it? Yeah, the, the history for me and brutalism is uh, quite long. Like the interest started very early on when I cons consumed media, um, like for example, the Blade Runner movies or um, the Akira comics, uh, maybe some of you know them. Um, there was some, there was something very interesting about it for me. This, this huge um, brutalist mega structure that appeared in these, uh, in these words. Um, I think um, when when I first got into it, uh, I can't really describe uh, why I liked uh, brutalism so much. Uh, and the only thing I could do is uh, expressing it and and trying to recreate it in a virtual environment. And um, after I played the um, indie game Nessancé, I hope I pronounced it correctly, um, it's free on Steam, you should all check it out. It's very, it's very good. It's a walking simulator and you are exploring a huge mega structure. Um, you're all on your own. There's no really life or, or other NPCs going around. It's just about the exploration and um, the experience um, you have in it. Uh, this was really striking for me and it was the first time I, I, I experienced this feeling and then I tried to um, get myself deeper into the into the field of, of game design and environmental artist um, and um, after I found out that this game is only developed by one single person um, I was very confident that I should give it a try and yeah that's basically how it started uh, and then I tried to make my own uh, small experiences um, they are all very short and and very simple um, and they heavily focus on, on brutalism. In those um, beautiful environments that you, um, that you 3D modeled, that you designed, there's this um, path that is sometimes linear and sometimes very confusing. Um, what is your aim when you design these environments? Are you aiming to lead us? What's your story structure in a sense? And how is it um, supported by the digital structure? Um, yeah, it's very interesting because um, when you create a game, it is of course you have you are limited in your abilities. Um, you can't just create a huge space and and all by your all all by your own. I mean, all the games you know, like um, the big AAA titles, they're 
uh, tons of people working on one environment and they can make it happen to make one um, realistic feeling um, place like a city that feels alive and realistic. Uh, but for me, it is very, it's a big challenge to create environments that still feel like they are something bigger than they actually are. So it's a lot of smokes and mirrors in a way. Um, you, you kind of give the illusion that there is something behind a closed door, even though there is nothing behind it. Um, so I create my environments more chaotically, maybe than the conventional uh, linear games do. Uh, so that the player is in this uh, illusion that there is not a linear experience, but instead he is exploring the, the experience um, um, for the first time and has the, f the feeling of free choice in a way. I mean, this resonates a lot with what you just mentioned with Akira, with um, sometimes even Ghost in the Shell, where you see these um, ginormous spaces that you roam in them alone. Um, yeah, I mean, what is your please? For me, um, it is something that I feel like a lot of people have when they're like in a big city or in a yeah in a, in a gigantic city, uh, even in Berlin maybe. When you're uh, maybe sitting uh, at your window in the evening and you look outside of the window and you see all the other windows uh, and there are lights in it, you don't really encounter people, maybe you feel lonely, but not in a depressing way, but more in a calm way. And then you realize that in, behind every window there is um, a, a con complex life like your own, and um, suddenly you don't feel that alone anymore, or maybe you don't feel um, that important anymore in a way, uh, if that makes sense. And that's also what I try to give in my experience. Uh, this feeling, there's actually, actually a word for it called sonder, um, that's like a state in your mind or brain, uh, I'm not an expert on that, but um, that's when you realize that every single face that you see, every single hum human being um, lives a complex life uh, like your own. Wow, <laughs> um, we're, get, we're getting um, super poetic, I, I guess I want to ask if you see these um, these spaces as utopias or dystopias, because there's something about brutalist architecture that depends on the beholder. It could be seen as both. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give a bit of background to it. Um, so brutalism is is a style that emerged in um, late 40s, beginning of 50s, something that we see a lot in Europe, but not only. Um, so Japan, also in North Africa, uh, also in the US, uh, also in South America, uh, but mostly emerging after this um, immense destruction following the Second World War. There was a need in building, in creating public spaces, in creating housing, and concrete was just available and very, very cheap. So all of a sudden, people at one end um, just catered to that need, providing housing. And on the other hand, we're trying to think about how to rebuild society and how to shape it with the structures that are around. And with that in mind, how do you see it in your games? Yeah, it's definitely something different. Um, I feel like every kind of brutalism you see in the real world tells a different story. Um, I feel like there are all kinds of different brutalism, um, rather it be like a Soviet kind of brutalism or a more uh, modern type of approach of brutalist style. Um, what I said before, like in, in Germany, there are a lot of churches in a brutalist style. And I feel like that's something that goes way, way, way back in, in our roots um, of our, of our um, civilization, this, this urge to create something monumental, something that lasts forever in a way. Um, I mean, the, the earliest uh, examples for that maybe includes things like Stonehenge or the Giza pyramids. Um, they are very monumental and, and like a monolithic uh, kind of feeling. I feel like that's, it is somehow giving the same feeling to me as um, modern brutalism is. And that's maybe also why churches uh, use it as a, as a design, because it got this, got this very sacrifice, sacrificial feeling, not sac sacred, sacred uh, feeling to it. And um, maybe there's a connection there. 
Definitely, yes. I mean, I have in my mind um, Dennis Lesden's National Theatre in London, for example. When you approach this building, which is just magnificent, you approach it as if it was a great mountain. And there's this um, feeling of a sublime almost. You're, you're faced with something that is so big and so enticing. Yeah. Just again? Um. Uh, are you still here? Because I, I lost yeah, the yeah, I, I see you. I hear you. Everything is fine. Um, Great. Yeah, I think um, there is something in humanity that urges the people to, or the civilizations, to build something very big, something very, um, yeah, monumental. In a way, that's also what interests me a lot because all the spaces that I try to uh, build in my games, um, they are very unrealistically large, like almost in a sense that you never experience, you will probably never experience something like that uh, in your lifetime. Um, and that's what makes it so interesting for me as well. There's something that we, um, we must put, you know, we must uh, emphasize on. It's, it's exactly there. Because brutalism has to do with a bit on brut, has to do with materiality. And computer games are entirely different in those remarks. And even more so, when people talk about the style, they talk about something, a material that is true, that is honest, that when you work with it, whatever other material, whatever support, whatever part of the process of casting um, leaves a mark on the concrete. And in a sense, um, digital materiality is almost like lying or telling a story about something that is not there. How, yeah. how, how is that catering to your game design? It is very interesting because for me it is important that I um, portray a realistic feeling of, of uh, brutalism. Um, you maybe think it is easy to, to create a brutalist building in an environment because it's only one single color, uh, not really a color, and um, that's all. It, like, it, it feels very uh, simple to do, like there are no ornaments or, or uh, details uh, to the building which makes it... Um, that creates the illusion that it's fairly easy to build, um, but it's actually a big challenge to to fool the the eye into giving a realistic um, concrete feeling. Um, there is so much more than just the texture. There there are leaks or weathering to the to the environment that happen over time. Like for example, when you look at the old concrete building, you see all those marks uh, on top of the surface, which you also have to. Uh, fake digitally and which I also am still learning to do um, and then there's not only the visual side there's also the the audio side of it for example how does the player sound when he walks over uh, over the material like this is all um, adding up on on giving this illusion uh, and making the experience more immersive um, everything the objects that collide with the concrete they have to sound uh, in the right way for the player to believe it yeah, that's very, very true. There's something about um, recreating something from memory. Um, and I guess it resonates also when you talk about digital, uh, digital environments. In, in the conversation that we had before, uh, you mentioned that one of your favorite brutalist building is uh, the Nakagin capsule tower. Um, recently demolished. Um, they decided uh, eventually not to, um, um, to save it. And um, walking around in your environments and, and witnessing your work, I, I noticed that you make a similar use of modules and a lot of shapes. Um, how is that supporting your story? Yeah, I think it's partly coincidental um, because in, in, when you design a game or in a, an environment for a game, um, it is easier to work with modules, uh, with like sort of Lego bricks, um, that way you don't have to um, work out the whole environment, but instead you use different uh, puzzle pieces and piece them together in a way that you can quickly box out uh, a large space. Um, for this year's uh, space, by the way, I just noticed that there are two big projections um, of my space. So even if we don't see it on here, uh, maybe you can uh, look at that so you have an idea uh, about what it looks like. Um, but yeah, to work with modules is, is very convenient uh, when you work in a small team or alone. Um, for this space, I actually um, tried to 
abandon this a little bit, um, try to be more um, using more white boxing and, and converting these white boxes into the actual space. Um, but in generally, working with modules, um, yeah, it's, it's very, very great. And when, when you design, um, which approach do you take? Do you think about those environments as, as a whole? Do you use the, um, the user's perspective uh, when you design? Do you start from inside out, outside in? Yeah, um, it, it is actually something that's very free form for me. Like I, I, I first let, get myself inspired by a certain media. Uh, I look at pictures, um, I watch a movie or something, and then suddenly I have an idea uh, of a space uh, I want to um, create. And after that, I just go into the engine um, on my PC, and then I try to just block it out, uh, roughly how I see this picture in my mind. I don't do a lot of sketches or, or um, um, planning. Like Most of the things happen in engine for me. It's the it's the best way to be directly connected to it. There is no boundary in between of a sketchbook or something. I mean, maybe yeah, maybe it's better to plan something like this, but uh, for me it's, it's, it's way more unfiltered when I create a space. And while I'm doing that, while I create the space, uh, I continuously check and go inside the space, look at the space out of, the, out of a first-person pers perspective. And after that I go back and do iterations, and over time the the space changes in a way that uh, matches my vision the closest. I think as soon as, I mean, architecture at large has been ongoing with um, a lot of digitalization since early 90s. And um, this perspective that architects have nowadays is very much affected by computer game designers. Even when talking to clients, um, AR and VR, these are tools that we use. So in a way, these two fields um, may be separated by, by materiality and scale, all of a sudden are converging um, thanks to technology. And there's this anticipation also that a building becomes a bit more like a computer game. And I, I still need to work my, my head around it. Um, there's something about um, the environments that you make uh, that I very much appreciate that are not only like computer games, but very much feel noir. Can you tell us a bit about how you use darkness and light in your environment? Yeah, um, what, you, what you said about the similarities between architecture and video games um, is actually something that is um, yeah, very um, interesting to me because uh, when I first got into level design and environmental design, there was a GDC talk I listened to and this person recommended this book. Um, it's called 100 Things I Learned in Architecture School. It's a it's a book. <laughs> it's a book only for architects in a way, but uh, apparently it really is very similar to to level design and how uh, a player, how a person um, experiences a space, how you can make the traversing of a space easier and more convenient uh, for a player and the person. I'm uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm psyched because I have it here on my shelf. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I got it as a as a bachelor student, um, and yeah, and I, I feel like kind of the mid ground between these two practices is cinema, because architecture takes a lot after cinema. Even if we think about uh, Parc de la Villette in Paris, that is this um, a walk through like red hot elements that is a cinematic walk that you walk and the building kind of opens towards you. And I had the same feeling in, um, in your environment, and even more so, um, how you signify where to look and what to do using shade or using um, lighting. And I wonder what, uh, what your inspirations are. Um, yeah, movies are also a huge inspiration for me. Um, I love to watch movies and um, I love to take inspiration from movies as well. And as you mentioned, lightning is very important um, for digital spaces, of course also for uh, real-life architecture. Um, the light is probably like half of the equation for, for my experiences. For example, what I do in my uh, environments is that I use um, realistically bouncing light. Um, to get more into that, it's um, that light behaves in a way that it reflects and um, bounces off of surfaces. Um, 
And that's not easy to, to, um, to fake inside a game in real time. Um, so what you have to do is baking uh, the environment. It's called light baking. You, you just set certain light zones or, or uh, point lights and then you let the computer bake, like render um, over time. And then it calculates realistically behaving light because the human eye is very good at pointing out um, whether a light in an environment looks weird or not real. Um, so it's very important to me to, to really give this illusion of, of realistically behaving light. And in cinema, for example, um, with film noir, it is very um, common to, to use light and shadows to frame or express, express um, a certain um, scene, to create a certain mood. Um, sometimes it's better to show not so much uh, rather than light up the whole room, and maybe just a um, good uh, light beam or, or use some uh, real, like environmental light from the sun um, to fill up a room uh, better than using a bunch of lamps uh, to, to use in the room. I'm thinking about um, scenes where light and shade resonate um, almost an inner state of mind uh, of the character shown on screen. And I feel like it's a, it's a two-way direction, or it's a two-way path, you know, in a sense, because you can control how we feel about something. Also, in architecture, we do that as well. Like, we can control a feeling through light and shade and guide it, and it's, it's like a loop. Um, I, I was wondering about something, because we keep taking it back to reality. We talk about faking a materiality as if it was the real thing. We talk about light and shade as if it was the real thing, and then there's so much freedom in computer game. You don't have to abide to any rule whatsoever, not to gravity, not anything. Why do you choose to do it? Um, yeah, to, to st stick with uh, real life rules, um, for example, gravity and uh, realistic feeling, is important to me to get the player immersed uh, because the player will only have its real life experience to compare uh, to my experiences. So the more close I get to, to the feeling, to the atmosphere of a real life space, sometimes I exaggerate it a, a little bit maybe, um, creating an overly atmospheric space. Um, but it's important for me because these um, kind of um, spaces and environments, they are, they are immersing the player better than like an abstract space, for example. You could create an abstract space, but um, the player won't be that deep inside of it. He won't lose himself, maybe herself, himself. And that's very important to me. And in order for them, is there any way of um, way, wayfinding or pathfinding um, that you use when you design a game? Or is it about getting lost and never finding yourself? It's a mix out of both things. I, I really encourage um, the player to lose um, themselves sometimes. Um, but of course, when you create a game, it's also important that um, the player uh, has to find um, it, its final goal. And um, of course, when I started making these experiences, I, I didn't care about if the player finds around uh, in my environments or not. Um, I, that was totally not, it, it was, yeah, I, don't, I didn't care about it. Um, but the more I got into like professional game making, um, I had to, yeah, I, I had to conform to some of the um, things that you have to do in, in game design and level design. So, um, yeah, it's a mix. Sometimes I, I, I create a chaotic environment to make the player feel lost, uh, but sometimes, of course, I, I guide the player with uh, light, the right lightning or, or like audio cues um, or the overall shapes and forms uh, of, of the architecture. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you also because ah, you got into that um, a bunker talk before I had the, <laughs> the chance to join on it. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I'm, I'm still curious about it because, um, first of all, to whom visiting Berlin at the moment, there are so many overground bunkers and they're the most interesting thing to visit. And um, some of them turned into um, in 
museums and art collections, some of them so enormous and indestructible that were used as a base for, uh, for social housing, like the one in Schöneberg. And I remember you told me there's one in Hamburg as well that is an overground... Uh, a lot, a lot of them. <laughs> And I was wondering if um, if you ever copy environments that you know, if you ever use your own memories into environments. Um, not 100%. Like, I don't copy um, and replicate environments that I see in real life. I definitely get inspired by it. For example, the space I did for a maze this year uh, was heavily inspired by the Philippine uh, brutalism. Um, that's a whole um, category of brutalism that I got into lately. Um, apparently there are a lot of um, beautiful brutalist buildings there. And um, what interests me about it is that there is also a lot of uh, vegetation and uh, nature besides of it, uh, which I usually don't do, uh, do so much. Uh, usually the nature side of it is... Um, not so important for my work, also because um, it is harder to do and takes more time uh, to get a realistic uh, vegetation into your game. Um, but this year I, I wanted to have this contrast be between like a nat natural environment and this alienating uh, brutalist space. Hmm, now I'm... Uh I'm trying to wrap my head around post-human uh, environments, and I'm I'm curious what's uh, what's next for you. What is interesting to you to discover? Um, yeah, what's next to me is um, currently I'm working on a game called Neon Entropy. Um, it's my biggest project yet. Uh, I work uh, with a team uh, on it. It's not only me, uh, and there's also some rules that are applying to it. Um, because it's going to be published and uh, it's getting funded, so I have to. I have to um, conform to some um, of the mainstream rules of games, but it's okay for me to uh, get a little bit out of out of my box. It's actually very fun to get out of my box and use all the things that I um, learned over the years uh, and apply them to a conventional game. Um, so yeah, at the moment I'm I'm designing and creating this game. Um, what comes after that? I, I honestly I have no idea. I'm I'm very interested in. Um, art installations and um, especially uh, light art installations and also art installations that shape and change over time during uh, visitors uh, exhibit these installations. And what I would love to do in the future, like maybe in 10 years or something, is to use some of all this, those beautiful abandoned uh, brutalist buildings that I see in my city, like uh, parking lots that nobody uses or, or rarely uses and I always think when I uh, visit those spaces that this could be a perfect environment for uh, an exhibition or, or like an art installation uh, so someday in the future I would love to yeah do something like that and, and get a little bit more into the real world with, with my ideas and uh, with my experiences. I, I love that idea. I, I think a great part of why I'm so in love with Berlin is that um, this is a city that really knows how to use its abandoned spaces and make something delicious out of it. And in many ways, um, counterculture, I mean, we talked about the different aspects of brutalism, and one of which is that it's housing so much counterculture, be it um, UK hip hop, be it techno in Berlin, whatever. Um, and um, I can't wait, really. I think you're marking uh, with your wrist that we're about uh, to arrive the time. I'm not sure, actually. I lost track of time for now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take it three, as a compliment. Three minutes? Okay, yeah. Um, maybe we should wrap it up. Um, but I'm glad that it worked even without showing uh, some pictures. We had uh, some great um, visual material. Uh, to show um, that would if would have been maybe even better for some of the people who don't have an idea what we are really talking about. Um, but for the people who are more interested in that, um, you can maybe just follow us. Uh, I, I think we have a, a constant output of of uh, these ideas, and and um, also I, I post a lot of uh, or repost a lot of things that just inspire me. That just uh, when I, whenever I feel like this certain atmosphere um, gets hit, then I repost it. And maybe some of you are interested in that. Oh, you know what? I have an idea. 
why don't we use your beautiful space for the exhibition and we can upload our references and images there. So if you're interested to learn more about brutalism and also to witness uh, more of Moshe's beautiful work, you can find it in the MA space. How about that? Sounds very good to me. <laughs> awesome. Then I think we're just in time. And yeah. I thank all of our audience for um, first your patience and um, <laughs> for being here. Yeah, I'm very and thankful. Thank you. And to you, Moshe, it was a wonderful conversation. Yeah, I would, I would love to do such talks like every week. I uh, love to talk about such <laughs> topics. And it's even greater to have like an expert to talk to. Uh, I watch a lot of uh, content media about this topic and um, it's the first time I actually had the chance to talk to an expert and that's very valuable to me. Thank you, Jilly. My absolute pleasure. And good luck with the rest of the conference. All right. Thank you, Moshe. Thank you, Jilly, so much. It was wonderful to was listen to, even though with, the, with some hiccups. Um, again, I want to call out again, go check out the Amaze space. It's an incredibly beautiful built space by yours truly. And it, as you said, follow Moshe, follow Jilly to see more about brutalism.